went in and rescued them from their Lamplighters League right down. Anyway, cool. Do you know what really sucks here, right? Uh, the developers of this game have been put into a really hard situation. I mean, they've had uh, you know, a lot of toxicity, a lot of craziness, because look, there's lots of players who are not expressing themselves in the most uh, constructive way. Is it really a fault here? Well, it's probably that the people who are rushing the games out early, thus meaning the developers don't have the time to do their job. It's really, you know, making, it, making the devs' lives harder is only going to hurt. It is very much not helpful. We should squarely be focused on the people who actually, you know, have the keys to power, who make the really big decisions, and in this case, that is Paradox Interactive. Wow. So yeah, maybe they'll learn their lesson, but it's very sad that a very large and like usually really good gaming community had to suffer the way that it did. That is it for today's story. You can check out what we published yesterday after this one. Of course, we do publish daily if you want to support the show. Then one of the best ways to do that is to check out our sponsor. Okay, have a great Hey everybody, so being mean about Black Mirror is kind of a tradition on this channel, one that I value very highly. Recently, the new season came out after a few years of waiting, and while there were episodes this season that I did quite like and we will talk about them, I was frankly relieved to find that many of them were pretty dang bad. That while the highs are fairly high, the lows are devastating. I hope you sit back and enjoy while I talk about my favorite thing to hate watch, new episodes of Black Mirror. Spoilers for all of season 6, by the way. I'm gonna ruin it for you. I'm not just gonna ruin it for you by telling you everything that happens, I'm gonna make you hate it. Okay, let's talk about Lock Henry, the second episode of the season. Lock Henry is about a couple, Davis and Pia, who are trying to make a true crime documentary about a spree of serial murders that happened in Davis's hometown. And as it turns out, oh shit, the protagonist mom was one of the serial killers all along. So I don't like Lock Henry all that much, and honestly, that's mostly just because there's nothing really in it uh, to enjoy for me. It's really slow, like I'm not sure what I'm supposed to get out of this documentary making sequence or why it had to be so much of the episode. I find the characters really one-dimensional and boring. Pia in particular feels more like a caricature of an annoying faux progressive lib than she does a person. And it's a story. It's an actual story. Are you serious? Well, yeah. Oh, what do you mean that guy on Wednesday? Fuck that guy. I'm sorry. Come on. Come on. And I found her death in the final act to be just extremely lazy writing. <laughs> Fucking oops. <laughs> and the plot just isn't Black Mirror at all. There's no interesting high concept premise or technology to explore. It's genuinely just a very conventional horror film about people making a true crime documentary, and it's a pretty bad one at that. What I find most interesting about this episode, though, is its ending. So after the events of the episode, there's a time skip. The protagonist wins an award for his true crime documentary about his murderous mother and dead girlfriend, and there's a a few things the episode does to make us feel uncomfortable. For one, the trophy the protagonist wins is a mask, evoking the mask his mother wore as she tortured and murdered people. And in the last moment, we see that before his mother hanged herself, she collected the tapes of her murders for him and wrote the note, for your film. These final touches make a very obvious point. There is a connection between the mother, someone who made a film of her gratuitously exploiting people for her entertainment, and the protagonist, who made a film that gratuitously exploits those same people for the world's entertainment. This point is, you might argue, well-placed. There is something exploitative about true crime, about the way it turns people and their tragedies into entertainment. But here's my issue, the episode just does a really poor job communicating these problems with any kind of clarity. See, when I think about issues with true crime, a number of obvious things pop into my head. There's an incentive on the part of true crime creators to obscure information in the name of telling a better story. There's a tendency to jump to conclusions, pretend you're a detective, and make claims you have little evidence for. Pseudoscience abounds in true crime. There's often an emphasis on lie detector tests, body language, and vibes. But none of these things actually apply to the situation. The protagonist does a plainly good job with his movie. He does normal investigative journalism. He doesn't lie and doesn't really sensationalize anything. Besides that, you know, he solves an unsolved crime, genuinely adds knowledge to the world. Yes, he goes against the wishes of this one older guy, but he had these objections largely because he was worried they'd find evidence of the actual criminals. You have to stop your film. Why? And I'm not sure objections like that deserve to be honored. In any case, he is in the final documentary, so it seems like his moral issues have been resolved by the end. In other words, I don't think the episode does what it sets out to do. It wants to make this big thematic statement about the world of true crime, but it's unwilling to make that point comprehensible or meaningful to the audience. So, in the end, the connections between the protagonist and his murderous mother just feel misplaced and mean-spirited. If the only thing I'm supposed to take away is, wow, both psychopathic murderers and true crime producers turn suffering into entertainment, I guess I just find that extremely vapid. I was going to end my section on this episode here, but I wanted to take this opportunity to make a point, one that may be obvious to many of you, but which I still think is valuable. A question might occur to you while watching this video: Why is Big Joel so weirdly obsessed with the theme? of Black Mirror. Why is it such an emphasis here when obviously media is so much more than the ideas it expresses? It's a good question, I think. After all, I'm not watching Black Mirror primarily because it's profound, because it gives me new important insights on the world. I don't care that much about true crime or about why people might dislike true crime, so why is the episode's treatment of it so important to me? And the answer is, I think, a tiny bit tricky. The reason I care so much about the end of an episode of Black Mirror, about the way its themes culminate, is quite similar to the reason I care how a whodunit ends, the way the detective solves his case. The end of a whodunit is the point at which the show reflects on itself. It takes elements that may appear chaotic or unrelated and shows us how they all tie together. It rewards the audience's attention and engagement and makes them feel the experience was intentional. That there was no aspect of the work that wasted their time. Here, we see the problem with Lock Henry, and it's not really that it's too vapid or that the point it makes is bad. No, the problem is that it doesn't pay off. The episode has all these elements, right? The slightly immoral coded girlfriend who wants to get famous off a true crime documentary, the guy who's familiar with the crime and wants it to not be investigated, the malignant serial killer mother. But these elements don't come together, they don't make a point or say anything, and in the absence of that, the episode fakes it, fakes a conclusion. Wow, isn't it deep that both the protagonist and his evil mom made videos about people who were killed? Isn't that impactful? But no, it, it isn't. It doesn't come from anywhere, it's not earned in any way, it's just a random twist of a knife that feels like it exists only because the episode needed an ending and couldn't really think of one, where the murderer is a random guy we've never met. Oh my god, I didn't realize that you were all at the beach with me. Um, let's talk about Beyond the Sea. My guess is that this is going to be the most controversial section of this video, because I can imagine that some people really like it. The plot is kind of interesting, it has Aaron Paul, um, and for these two reasons, people may have enjoyed it. I didn't enjoy it though, I actually thought the episode was uh, strikingly bad. Beyond the Sea is about two astronauts who are presumably doing some nasty stuff in space. Their real bodies are in the cosmos, but they both have digital robot cells they can project their consciousnesses into. Everything's going great, but then one of the astronauts, Dave, has his wife murdered by some freaks who hate robots. Man, sle
while his mechanical image walks the earth. And you share your bed with this abomination. Episode about this guy, please. Give me the robot hating Jesus lover. To help him deal with the grief, the other astronaut, Cliff, lets him use his robot. Would you? Would you like that? I think I'd like that very much. And Dave, in his Cliff robot body, ports and tries to have sex with Cliff's wife, Lana. He won't know. In the end, Lana rejects these advances, and Dave murders her and her son. So my first problem here, and I know I sound like a broken record, is that I thought the episode was just very, very boring. Beyond the Sea is an hour and 20 minutes long, a short feature-length film, and I don't think it used that space economically. Over the course of its runtime, the characters don't really become more interesting, they don't have engaging conversations. It feels like 80 minutes of dour, blank, annoying characters sitting quietly and yearning for each other. It's not my kind of thing. Uh, I would vastly prefer a 30-minute version of this episode, and I don't know why that's too much to ask. Just cut everything out. out of your episode. Make it so much shorter, why not? But with that in mind, let's turn our attention to the themes of the episode, the way it explores its own ideas, because there is something intricate and complicated about Beyond the Sea. So this episode is, at its core, about disposability. These two men have robot equivalents. Their Earth bodies are machines, and if those machines die, the person lives on. They are, in a very real sense, disposable. But by the end of the story, the episode complicates this idea. In the very first scene, Dave dances with and has hand sex with his wife. I feel like I need to point something out here. Uh, is the only word for manually stimulating a woman uh, fingering? Is that actually correct? Because I'm not going to say fingering in a YouTube video and pretend like that's normal and doesn't make me sound like a 12 year old. I feel like there needs to be a better word. <laughs> I came up with hand sex. Anyway, later on, after Dave's wife is murdered, and he's in Cliff's body, he comes onto Lana and does so in the exact same way he came onto his late wife. He plays the song Beyond the Sea in both scenes as well, which both cements how similarly he's approaching these two situations and tells us as an audience that the similarity is important, right? It's the name of the episode. In this moment, the audience is forced to consider a possibility that Dave and his robotic form are not the disposable ones, that instead his wife is and Lana is. He lost the former and moves on to the latter, and he wants to treat the two women identically as though they are interchangeable robots. And when you see this theme, you can notice it in a few places. You can see it in the way Cliff talks about his family. When he's upset that Dave seems infatuated with his wife, the one thing he says over and over is, My wife! You fucking creep! My wife! She's mine. She belongs to me. That is, for much of the episode, Cliff sees his wife not primarily as a person, but as a possession to be safeguarded. You can see it toward the middle of the episode, when Cliff's son annoys Dave, and he slaps the boy in the face. Lana is outraged by this, but Cliff doesn't seem to mind. He beats the kid all the time, and this is the kind of power that can be delegated. He hit him. He gave him a little smack upside the head. Which, as far as Henry knows, was from you. Nothing I haven't done myself a hundred times. You know Henry can be a terror. Remember when he burned a hole in the car seat? I wailed on him plenty, right here in this room. The boy needs keeping in line. The child doesn't exist as a person within Cliff's imagination, but as an object who can be treated however men want to treat him. Finally, you can see it in the end, when Dave kills Lana and her son. The whole episode is about this lengthy romance. Will Lana fall in love with Dave? Does Dave give Lana what Cliff cannot? But in the end, this is all an illusion. Dave doesn't love Lana. You can't love someone, cherish someone, who you're willing to murder for no reason. No, Lana exists only as a prop within the male psyche to be used and disposed of at her owner's convenience. It's simple. Dave's wife was killed, so Lana can be killed. This is kind of the twist of Beyond the Sea, right? In one of the last scenes of the episode, Cliff finally talks to his wife. He shares some emotion with her, treats her as a real person with real needs. You brought me here, put me in this house. Now I just walk room to room, and you walk from room to room with your shadow, and I am here, I am real. But this all comes too late, because right next to the moment Lana is treated as valuable, she's thrust right back into the realm of disposability, murdered by Dave. So, yes, I think Beyond the Sea is about patriarchy, about a system that privileges male experience and jealousy and desire, and that treats women as objectified means to an end. There are other ways you could, of course, read it, but I do think this is the most interesting and charitable way, and that it's supported by the text. It's, of course, not a coincidence that the episode takes place in 1969, when patriarchy was even more codified and explicit than it is today. But, okay, does this, does my read of the episode, make it good for me? I don't really think so. For one thing, I just don't think it sticks to the landing. Like, sure, it's a story about patriarchy but it doesn't really challenge its own logic. It's notable at the end of the episode that Lana and the kid dying are never framed as bad in their own right. We don't see their suffering and we're not really put in a position to care about their deaths. Rather, the loss is processed only through Cliff. It's his loss, his tragic ending. You can say that's part of the point that even when these people are murdered, they are still only given meaning through the male lens, but it just doesn't play for me. The end of the episode doesn't feel like it's getting at that point, doesn't feel like it challenges these men and the position they have. It feels basically like it's played straight, and we're supposed to see the protagonist and his loss as the episode's ultimate twist, that I am supposed to take this framing seriously. And I don't, I don't take it seriously. But also, you know, leaving all this theme stuff aside, you just can't theme your way out of boring storytelling. When you're not interested by any of the characters or by anything they do, when you think the love triangle is dull and don't care what happens with it, when you think the material is bloated, you're probably not going to enjoy the episode, regardless of things you can say about its themes. So Demon 79 is, I think, the best episode of the season. It's about a woman, Nita, who gets chosen by a demon to execute three people to save the world, and it's cute. Basically, we need to deliver three sacrifices by Mamus. Uh, Mayday to you, or else it's... Oh, burning stars time. The relationship between the protagonist and her demon BF works, they have chemistry, it's funny, you actually care about the characters. And perhaps most importantly, it's like shockingly cool message-wise. The third person Nita picks to sacrifice is a Tory politician, and the show makes two things clear. First, the Tories are psychotic fascist weirdos. Don't look around to see it. Rubbish in the streets, crime on the rise, the character of your neighborhood, on the threat. In one scene, a woman is talking to the politician about how she would rather vote for the more racist candidate. I hope you have your vote this week. Afraid not. National Front for me. Oh, why is that? Don't like how things are changing on here. And he's like, you know what I stand for, you know we're the same guy. But they won't get elected. They might. They're like to avert. People feel it's, um, that matters. You know why I don't print stop immigration in gigantic letters on my campaign literature? Because look at me. Look at me. 